second speaker tonight may not be as well known to Irish audiences, but she has been a major figure in the UK for over 25 years and is responsible for the sporting policy and infrastructure, which were the building blocks that led to UK's most successful Olympic glory in Beijing and more recently in London in 2012. She and Pat Duffy would have shared a love of sport and a positive and the belief of the positive impact sport can have on people and on society. Baroness Sue Campbell was an international pentathlete and netball player. Earlier in her career, she was a PE teacher and a PE and sports science lecturer at Leicester and at Loughborough Universities. From 1985 to 1999, she was the chief executive of the National Coaching Foundation now known as Sports Club Coach UK. She then joined the Youth Sports Trust and was at the helm of that organization for 10 years, playing a key role in setting up the setup of, the, of, of this as an independent charity that aims to change people's lives through sport and physical education. In 2003, Baroness Campbell was appointed as chair of UK Sport the new name for the Sports Council of Great Britain, and led that until 2013, where she basically revolutionized the elite sports structure that led to Team GB and Paralympic GB's greatest medal haul in 2012. Baroness Campbell received an MBE and a CBE in 2003, and in, 2000, um, and in November 2008, she became Baroness Campbell of Loughborough and sits on the cross benches of the, Lord, of the House of Lords. I've never met a Baroness before. <laughs> she has received 10 honorary doctorates and was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award. Sorry, Keith. <laughs> Achievement Award at the 2012 Sunday Times Sportswomen of the Year Award. And on BBC's Radio 4, she has been assessed as one of the 100 most powerful women in the UK. Baroness Campbell now serves on the board of UK Sports Trust and continues to advocate fiercely and passionately for sport and PE in schools. This year, the Sports Trust is running 20 power of PE twilight events that seek to improve the quality of PE teaching and supports for sport in schools. Very much a direct influence from Sue Campbell. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Baroness Sue Campbell who will speak about the sport. Thank you very much. I always find those introductions horribly embarrassing, so I will say but the most precious part of my CV is that I was a good friend of Patrick's. So after all of that, so that's probably as big a statement as I could make. That he was a big influence on my life and I hope I was a positive influence on his. Um, Deirdre and the family have been kind enough to host me all day today. And I know he'd have been immensely proud, Gary, to see what you've launched tonight. You've been very touchy, and as always, by your friendship and your words. And I know, Keith, that he would absolutely and passionately wanted to walk alongside you to make the health of this nation what he dreamed of and what he had been for. So I'm very proud to be here. I feel very privileged to have this opportunity. And I was trying to think what could I talk about that captured both the man and also provided some information that maybe gave you some time for thought and reflection. So I decided to talk about this because the one thing about Pat was he was a, a manager and he was a very clever teacher and he was a good visionary. But above all else, he was an incredibly good leader. But he always led with purpose. And that's really what I want to talk about. Uh, what does it mean to be a leader with purpose? And how did he exemplify that uh, throughout his life? And let me just say that um, my first meeting with Patrick was um, I, I had met your minister at the time at a dinner in Cork when I was chief executive of the National 
Coaching Foundation in the UK. And you were setting up the NCTC here in Limerick. And your minister invited me to come to the interviews. And uh, I came to the interviews, and the last candidate through the door was Patrick Duffin. Um, and we had a, a man that previously came in called John Kerwin. Um, and uh, Patrick came in, and I have to say, within five minutes, I had fallen in love. <laughs> I loved him for a number of reasons. He felt like a complete soulmate. There was something about his passion, his love for what he was talking about, his values. I could still see the fiery young man. He wasn't quite as calm as he was later on. Um, but I absolutely could relate to him. Uh, John, as you know, many of you got the initial role as director, uh, despite my protestations. Um, Pat became his deputy, and then, as you know, Pat took over at the National Coaching and Training Centre. And for a number of years, I came fairly frequently, not as frequently as Pauline and Penny, but I came fairly frequently to support Pat in the development of his tutor training. So I, 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 I've known him from those days. Uh, we've talked on so many occasions, and we shared the same passion for coaching. But the one thing I want to talk about tonight is him as a leader. So we're going to talk about a few things. His philosophy. What is the philosophy of a great leader? His moral purpose was incredibly clear. Keith said it and Liam said it in their description of him. His values were unquestionable and at times got him into deep difficulty because to have strong values means you can't completely compromise to go where others are trying to push you. And at times that made his life much tougher. And finally I'm going to talk about how he helped us all set the ambition. Good news, another reasonably successful leader. <laughs> and I've used him for a number of reasons. One is that South Africa was somewhere that Pat had a huge, and has continues to have a huge and positive impact on what's happening. Uh, but this quote, I think, kind of sums up Pat really well. And it actually builds really nicely on, on what Liam said. And that is, he built these wonderful relationships with individuals. Great leaders have an absolute belief in the power of individuals. In other words, they don't have to be out the front, they don't have to be the noisy one, they don't have to be the one that knows all the answers. In fact, Pat often did know the answers. But as he tempered that knowledge of knowing the answers with a real understanding that to be a great leader, people had to be cared for. Liam said in five minutes he would make you feel warm and welcome, and he did. You trusted him. So his relationship at an individual level was amazing. But also great leaders have that incredible ability, not only to build trust with an individual, but to corral a group of individuals to a common cause, to something that really matters to them. And he did that brilliantly, whether it was at the NCTC, but I particularly watched him do it when he came to Sports Coach UK. Um, I saw him go with unbelievable patience with some of the most difficult, sorry if you governing bodies by the way, but some of the most <laughs> difficult governing bodies you could possibly have dreamed of in the United Kingdom. And I watched him corral them and move them and persuade them and eventually get them to move. It was a great quality of a great leader to build individual trust that you are able to corral people to go in one common direction as indeed did this man. And I always think, with Nelson Mandela, there's two stories that I remember vividly, which talk about great leadership. When he was imprisoned on Robin Island for 27 years, if any of you have ever watched the film The Long Road to Freedom, you'll see that when he's first in prison, the state of the, uh, of the cell he's in is pretty terrible. And as it grows, it changes and it gets slightly better and better. And indeed, uh, the, the inmates were allowed to play football, unheard of when he first got there. How did he do that? He learned to build relationships with the people that people would have considered were his enemy. And he had this belief that you had to know your enemy better than you knew your friends. I think Pat was really good at that too. He got to know people who would stand in his way really well. 
in order that he could either take them, around, take them with him, or if not, go around them, which is what Nelson did too. And indeed, when Nelson was uh, made president of South Africa, he actually sat the prison warders on the front row at his presidential um, inauguration. Not sure I would have done, and I'm not sure many of us would have done. But his capability to forgive and to build relationships and to take people with him extended even to those he found most difficult. And the other story that many of you Keith, will know well is the Invictus story. Those of you who've seen the movie Invictus, where the symbol of white South Africa was that Springbok jersey. And the then sports council of South Africa, when he became president, wanted to get rid of that jersey because it was a symbol of white South Africa. And he said, no, this will be one nation. Imagine this, you know, you and I think we have challenges as PE teachers or coaches or leaders of a governing body or whatever we're leaders of, because you're all leaders, whether you know it or not, you're all leaders. Uh, even if you're a leader of a family, you are a leader. And imagine the challenge of leading that nation. And the reason he walked out at that final wearing that Springbok jersey was to take the nation with him and to say there will be one nation. Now, the challenge is still surviving South Africa, but there is no question that his leadership at that moment was immense, as was Patrick Douglas. And I, I don't likely put them in the same um, sentence, but I believe great leaders are few and far between. And I think Pat was a great leader, not just a good one. I, I, I've used that slide because when I was chair of UK Sport, I realised that um, one of the big challenges of any leader is staying clear about the moral purpose. Because UK Sport was funded by government. Um, it was, uh, in a sense, uh, it was what's called a non-departmental public body. It was an arm's length body. In other words, the government believed it ran it. But actually, my passion was athletes. And one of my challenges was how did I not get beaten up by the government whilst trying to do the right thing for the athletes? And that balance between um, doing what is right and doing what somebody's expecting you to do, or indeed telling you to do, was one we battled with too. Because he was not going to give in to things that other people thought he should do. Even if it meant taking on people in authority. Even if, at times, it meant being very uncomfortable. He wasn't prepared to do that. <coughs> because he was very clear about his moral purpose. Leaders know what their moral purpose is. They're not persuaded to move off it. They know it. You have to use all your skills to take people with you. But in the end, you have to face what you absolutely believe to be wrong. I got sacked three times as chair, as chair of UK <laughs> Three times because I would not bend on what I believed to be right. Fortunately, the next day they reinstated me. But I could well have lost my job. But there is a point when actually if you don't stand for what you believe in, you stand for nothing. And Pat Duffy wasn't prepared to stand for nothing. He was going to stand for something. And that was driven by his moral purpose. He's absolutely loose in what, what was right for athletes and coaches. He wasn't going to be pushed around by anybody, which carries its consequences. So that, to me, is, was his greatest strength, integrity. And again, if you look at people who are great leaders, whoever they are, they are people who do what is right, not what is popular or expedient. He always did what was right. But you've got to be very brave to do that. You've got to be very courageous to do that. And you haven't got to be frightened to get hurt. But because you get hurt. You know, I've stood, like him, in places that have been very painful. I've taken on people who thought they were more powerful, are more powerful, have more resource. But actually, doing what is right <coughs> doing what is the right thing to do, absolutely sat at his core. And integrity was a massive strength in him. And it's a massive strength in anyone who's a leader. And here's the other thing about working together. 
So if you if you have that strong moral purpose, but as you said, Liam, you've got to take people with you on the journey. How do you do that? And, and at UK Sport, we came up with this, this mantra, one team, one mission. One very clear mission that we had across the whole of UK Sport, which was to, people thought it was to win thousands of medals in London. And of course, that is the business output we were looking for. But it wasn't our moral purpose. Our moral purpose was really simple. Whether an athlete came from the Hebrides, Northern Ireland, should they not be here for Ireland, uh, Wales or London, who had the desire, who had the passion, who had the talent, who had that incredible commitment it takes to be a world class athlete. It is hard, hard work. It hits so many setbacks, it hits so many moments of self doubt, just like the rest of us. But these people who make it are special. They have that resolve in them that somehow gets them through those moments when the rest of us give up. They are remarkable. I always say elite athletes are remarkable, not because of the cups and the medals and the lion's caps, but because they have this unbelievable ability to travel that journey that most of us give up on. They fight through things that most people don't get through. That's why I love elite athletes. Selfish they may be, but remarkable role models of how if you have a dream, if you really want to do something, nothing stops you if you really believe in it and you're prepared to work with it and you're prepared to be committed to it. And you have a smidgen of time. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's what I believe. And I, I think, you know, what Pat was capable of is making everybody feel valued and everybody belong. But he also, um, just like Keith said, he he kind of was constantly prodding me with a stick. He was looking for the next little bit. What got categorised in UK sport terms as marginal gains by a man called Dave Browsky, who was our performance director for British Cycling and now manages the Sky Team. Um, but those marginal gains, that, that was Pat saying, there can be no complacency if you're searching for the best. If you want to be the best, you have to Surgeon. So that kind of constant desire. And finally, that sort of ability to make courageous decisions based on good information. He was unafraid to do that. But those are the, those are the attributes of someone who can take people <coughs> with them on the journey. They can make everybody feel good. They can keep prodding everybody to be better. And they're not afraid to make the decisions they have to, to be the best they can do. <clears throat> I think you recognise that baby. I hope you do. Um, I have to say, at London 2012, this was the most astonishing thing I've ever seen. Not her victory, because I think you all knew it was what we didn't know it was a done deal, but don't think it was a done deal. But the most amazing thing was, I don't know if you knew how difficult it was to get tickets for London. It was a nightmare. And yet on the day she fought her final, I walked into the arena and I could have been in Dublin. <laughs> How did all those Irish people get those tickets? I have never got that. That is the one thing in history that has remained with me forever. How did the old stadium turn green? I have no idea. We had poor old Nicola fighting just before, just after her, I think. He was just after her. And I went to shout for Nicola, and of course, he was just drowning out. <laughs> but anyway, she was amazing. <coughs> Um, but I know one of the things Pat really cared about was coaching. But he, he, his, his passion around coaching was getting the best for the athlete. His idea of being a great coach was not someone who was uh, the person who told the athlete, but somebody who enabled the athlete to be the best that they could be. And, and equally, you know, there are many people who work in our high performance system now who've adopted that same approach, and Dave Browse would be, be, would be one of them, where there is an absolute understanding that that old-fashioned style of coaching, one which I personally used to adopt, which was all <laughs> uh, is no longer the way to get the best out of our athletes. To get the best out of our athletes is about good questions, it's about enabling them to grow, it's about empowering them, it's about making them feel anything is possible. And these things, this attitude, 
is commitment, ownership, and responsibility is what leads to excellence. And, and I know Pat was passionate about that. And I know that many of you in the room who are really <coughs> passionate about coaching know his philosophy was, it was an athlete-centered approach to coaching and coach education. I think you know that chapter as well, I hope you do. Um, but one of the things that I also think great leaders do is they unlock creativity in people. Whether that's a coach working with an athlete, whether it's a PE teacher working with a class of students, whether it's a politician, well, no, I won't go that far. <laughs> whether, it's, uh, whether it's a leader of any kind, whether it's a, a, a vice president, a president, a vice president, a Trying to unlock creativity in people was something else that Pat was highly passionate about. And I think creativity is unlocking creativity in others is what makes you a great leader. You know, I, I, I often quote uh, something like the Fosbury flop. Yeah. Fosbury flop, where did it come from? It didn't come from a scientist, it didn't come from a coach, where did it come from? It came from the athlete. And why did it come from the athlete? Because the athlete was trying to do the old straddle and he realised that however good he was, he was never going to be the best in the world because he wasn't big enough. So he went away and thought, is there another way of getting over this blooming bar that's within the law that will help me jump higher? And he said, yes, yeah, centrifugal force. If I run in a curve, can you imagine the first time he did that and he broke his neck, I think. He threw himself backwards over the bar. In fact, there were some very bad accidents early on, not breaking their necks, but that bad accidents when people throwing themselves backwards over the bar. But you know, that's where creativity comes from. And we have to unlock that. And, and Pat's absolute passion around coaching, athletes, systems, health, was we've got to unlock creativity. In other words, if we're always going to do what we've always done, we're always going to get what we've always got. It's the definition of insanity. Doing what you've always done and think you're going to get something different. And he absolutely wasn't prepared to do that. He wanted to push those boundaries. That's where that great intellect of his, his ability to vision what was possible beyond what we could see, made him very special, unlocking creativity. <laughs> and finally, this one about performance coaching. You know, he believed coaching, as I do, was both a science and an art. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm passionate about that. But, you know, the management side of coaching, all of that science that you need to be a great coach, really important but the thing he loved was how did you inspire how did you motivate when did you make those tactical decisions about when to substitute people how did you know what strategy to apply gosh wouldn't we have loved to have been in the australian dressing room on saturday and all that long. but anyway um, would it make, no it wouldn't have made any um, but reality is that art, the art and science of coaching are equally important and, and while, while we can teach the science of coaching, the art of coaching, the art of great teaching, the art of great leadership, you don't learn out of a book. You don't learn it out of a book. You learn it by unlocking something inside you and watching and working with great leaders, great teachers, great coaches. That's where you gain the confidence to express yourself uniquely. And I had that great expression that Good coaches coach sport, great coaches coach people. And it's great coaches that he believed in. There you go, a, that, that's a, a Paralympian who you, you may or may not know. Um, but it, it, it's about this whole business of great leaders being people who have innovative thinking. You might ask, what is the Squirrel Club? The squirrel Club was the uh, was the area that we um, worked with our cyclists on, doing all sorts of things. We were looking at the aerodynamics, of bikes, clothing, helmets, and we knew we were winning. And in London 2012, the French said to us, 
your wheels are rounder than ours. No, I think we're winning now. doubt in your mind, we are definitely winning. So innovation. I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to finish with that, which is to say, Pat always had some slides. I haven't used his slides. I couldn't quite do that. I didn't feel uh, respectful. But he always used to finish with hope. And his, his mind, it was a young person, and I put young people up there. And he had this belief, as I hope you do, and I hope you will keep his, his memory alive in so many ways, but he always believed that he could make the world a better place for tomorrow's generation. That was what's special about him. That's why we're all missing. <laughs>